Thank you for joining us today for Jennifer Schaus and Associates in our webinar Wednesday program. We're coming to you live from Washington, D.C. Our webinars are every Wednesday and are provided complimentary. They can be downloaded from our website and YouTube channel, which now holds over 300 of our government contracting webinars. In the interest of time, we do not take questions, so if you have questions for our speaker, we will have his information on the last slide of the presentation today. A special thanks to our educational sponsor, the National Veterans Small Business Coalition, for making these webinars possible. The NBSBC is the largest nonprofit trade association for veterans. Please visit their website for more information. And now a little bit about us. We work with U.S. federal government contractors, including products, service, and software firms. Our services range from market analysis reports to contract vehicles and compliance. More information is on our website. Uh, we also have opportunities for your organization to advertise in our newsletter. We now reach over 17,700 subscribers, and this includes both contractors and government. Contact us for pricing information with the email shown on your screen. Okay, and now to introduce our speaker, David Dempsey. Welcome, David. We're glad to have you here with us today, and I'll turn the floor over to you. Okay, thank you very much, and hello to everyone. Appreciate you taking the time out of the uh, pandemic to listen to this. And I hope I can help you out. The uh, law firm I'm with, uh, Dempsey Fontana, is a, is a small law firm, and we basically uh, have quite a bit of experience among the, uh, the four of us. I've got 42 years myself, and, and uh, Jim Montana has been around 35, so between the two of us, we're pretty good. And uh, we essentially try to sell legal services that are valuable and, and worth, it, worth it to you all. So this element that I'm talking about today, which is going to be, as indicated by the next slide, is uh, on team agreements and, and leverage. And the leverage I'm going to be talking about is uh, those instances when you may have leverage over your prime and then also leverage over your uh, subcontracting. Competitors. So on, on the next slide, we'll do a little quick information here regarding uh, team agreements. We have two definitions in the FAR, and you can uh, see the sites there. The FAR 201 is just a general definitional section, and it indicates what two small companies would do and how they would represent, uh, present themselves. This, this is not a uh, contractor team in agreement or team arrangement, as it is the case under the GSA schedule. That is more of an actual subcontract because of the elements of the CTA requirements. So, go to the next slide, and we see that my focus is going to be on the, the normal vertical team structure. And those two final phases are essentially what, what the, the, the government, government wants out of the team agreement, agreement. And, and this is under FAR 9.6, and then what contractors want out of a team agreement, which is not having a father establishing a new entity like a uh, liability corporation where they have to populate it with people from their respective firms, et cetera. And then what the uh, team agreement does for contractors is it assists them in the technical and management risks by bringing in expertise that a company otherwise may not have. And then they also may um, have some socioeconomic considerations that are relevant to the prime uh, and perhaps a higher tier sub in this overall arrangement. So during these discussions or ruminations about whether or not you want to have a team in agreement, the first thing you got to ask is, do you want it to be exclusive? And I'll spend some time on that with some case law in a, in a few minutes. But you also want to focus on the work allocation, the amount of money you expect to make, the structure and control of the team in agreement, and then some uh, other basic 
elements of the uh, of any agreement, which is termination, uh, price, et cetera. And then with respect to the proposal, you want to make sure that you're going to be a part of it and all that. And I'll be speaking a good bit on uh, cyber compliance and supply chain management, because I think that is where we're going to have a biggest advantage over other uh, smaller companies, or for that matter, uh, any, any company. And of course, I want to stress the enforceability because that's what the next slide is about. As I mentioned already, you have to figure out if you want an enforceable payment agreement because the, the issue that has led to litigation occurs after the award of the prime contract to the government by the government and the the prime or the, the other team member or it could be a, a higher level subcontractor is going to uh, want to have a team agreement that uh, or excuse me, wants to have a subcontract that reflects a team agreement and you may not want that. You may not want to deal with a company, you may want to uh, get a better deal, et cetera, but normally it's the, uh, um, the prime who wants to drive down the price and do all the other things associated with reneging as, as, as the injured party reviews, uh, looks at reneging on the team. So we have the case law in the two jurisdictions here uh, in this area. I don't, I don't mention, mention the uh, District, District of Columbia's uh, law on uh, on team agreements, agreements because I always, always tell people never to go into the District of Columbia uh, litigation system, their courts, because their courts are uh, so crowded, and it'd be a while before before your uh, case can be heard with any type of uh, uh, use to you, you know, because you, you want to, you're going to want to get the contract to your human agreement turned into a subcontract, and you don't want to be going around in court while someone else is, is performing their contract. So, in the, uh, the CDI case, in Virginia Supreme Court, and this is really the Virginia Supreme Court, and this is a relatively recent case. It's, uh, they, they say you have to have a pretty specific team agreement to enforce future performance because otherwise they're going to consider it a, an agreement to agree, which is not going to have any enforceability to it. So, what, what Virginia seems to be looking at now is unless you have a contract for achieving a payment agreement that says you will be getting the award, and here are the terms and conditions associated with that award. Uh, and that goes back to the work, uh, the dollars, et cetera. Then you're going to have a, uh, an, an unenforceable payment agreement. And, and the Maryland, Maryland courts are the same, same thing. thing. In two, two, uh, 2015, the Maryland, Maryland Court of Special, Special Appeal, which is their Supreme Court, says if you have any open terms for involving the subcontract, it's going to be an unenforceable team agreement. And what I've got here are the notions that you want to have in your team agreement with some specific uh, reference. And, and that would that means the, the price or whatever your work share is going to be broken down into into plans if it's going to be in the context or the nomenclature of a uh, contract, a government contract. Key personnel, which puts an obligation on on you, you, on your, you, you as the as one, one signatory to the team agreement slash subcontract because. Um, the other, other party can say he didn't, didn't provide these key personnel, personnel so therefore it's, it's a, a uh, uh, breach on your part. part. And, and then, then all, all the other, other things. 
And now, now nowadays, because of the focus by the Defense Department and the non-defense agencies on cybersecurity, you're going to want to be able to have the the CMMC level in the teaming agreement because it's certainly going to be in your subcontract. Not, we're, we're going to go into detail on this later, but the, the emphasis here is to start thinking in terms of cybersecurity uh, slash CMMC and the elements of uh, this publication under uh, seventy one, and then supply chain management is another serious element. Now, to all the federal contracts, which we're going to discuss two, two statutes. statutes. One is the only, and the other, the other one is the entire, the entire uh, federal, federal government. government. So, so now, now we get to leverage. And the leverage, leverage that, that I'm talking about first is just to uh, make sure that you don't, don't think that social economic status is all that big a deal with respect to the large crimes. And that's because they have these uh, master subcontracting plans, which is what they're obligated to do with respect to the, uh, the government and the uh, subcontracting plan and their prime contract. And if you were to attend uh, just about any seminar sponsored by the government, which also the Small Business Administration and is participated, excuse me, includes participants from, from the local companies like Raytheon and uh, GIT, et cetera, GMS, excuse me, then, then you'll uh, see that all those spokespeople are going to say, we have to perform the contract and we are not going to retain or get involved with a made a company or woman owned company or whatever simply because their social economic status they have to they have to be able to perform and that is i think a very fair analysis and, and i'm just you know on the next slide go to that one all right all right all right There we go. That's, That's what I was talking about with the leverage and the social status. So let me get to what elements do you have with respect to your company over other competitors who may be wanting to get involved with the same program and also get involved uh, with that particular time. Uh, well, right, right now it's uh, cybersecurity. Supply chain, supply chain management, and then, and of course, course we, say, uh, we have uh, COVID-19 issues. So, so go to the next slide. slide, I've got an explanation that will get you to, to what's, what's referred to as level, level one in the cybersecurity maturity model certification. If you can go, go to this website, website I've given you, the uh, DPAP website, which is, which is now uh, defense pricing and contracts, you'll see that that, uh, that ability to get to level one is spelled out in the Annex A to this November 14, 2019 memo, which has quite a history to it. Uh, about Two and a half years in the making. But the point of it is that the assessment of Annex A, the, 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 the Annex following Annex A, will, will get you to C and then C level one. And as the, the, the CMMC DOD office goes around saying all the time, most, they, they, they're they now saying that most of the subcontracts will be at level one. one. And I don't agree with that because they eventually want to get everybody to level three. And that, that's, that's a big leap. leap. Uh, to put this in terms of requirement, level one has 17 requirements. Level three has 130. 
So there's a big delta in there. Level two is approximately uh, 75, I believe. Um, but the 75 requirements come from the CNSC model version 1.02, which you can see by the date is very recent. The first model version one came out in late January, January 30th. It's already been amended. The value to the CMNC model, which is uh, available, you know, on the on the, on the internet, of course, you just Google uh, cyber security maturity model certification, and the correct uh, link will come up, and you'll be able to get these these uh, other <coughs> levels. We want to look at level one and walk you through this a little bit so you'll get an idea. Level one is based on FAR clause that has been around since 2016. The DOD cybersecurity clause, which invokes this uh, special publication 800-71, and it's see it's now, now Revision 2. I came out, out, out in February. February. The DOD clause says you must, you must, must satisfy the requirements in NIST uh, SB 100 171 and the most recent version thereof. So that's, that is your requirement. When you go to this uh, website with Annex A, they are going to identify with an asterisk. Those, those elements, elements of, of the NIST program, program that, that equal CMMC level one. Uh, keep, keep in mind that, that CMMC, CMMC is going, going to replace, replace the, the NIST. NIST. Uh, and, 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 and we know that because this has told, told us that, and the uh, uh, DOD has told us that, and these clauses I'm talking about are going to be. Uh, essentially replaced with, with a requirement that you meet level one, two, three, four, five. So, so the level, level one, one is based, based on the FAR clause, and that is FAR clause 2.204-21. And in there, there are, are 15, 15 items that the, that the FAR wants you to have in your cybersecurity program. But now, but now the DOD has, has taken, taken that clause, and in this annex, they identified, identified what elements of the list that give you the CMMC level one. one. For, For example, example, if you went to the NIST requirement that, that says uh, limit system access to, to the type of transactions and functions that authorized users are permitted, permitted to execute, that, that would be uh, uh, this 171, paragraph 3.1.2, and if you go to the CMMC matrix, which is on page A4, you would see that that this and then the Center for Internet Security, Critical Security, Critical Security Control, is also a source, and the CERT resilience management model, and, and CERT is a computer emergency response team. You would see that all of those, if you follow one of those controls, that would satisfy one of the 17 elements to level one. And and then and, and I'm I'm giving it a I've given a couple of talks already on this, and I can uh, tell you that it, it, it appears complicated, uh, but, but it's not due, due to the explanations in Annex B. And those those clarifications, as it says on the bottom of the screen here, is actually plain English, English gives you examples, and shows you that. 
basically, basically you've got, got a lot of level one already, already just, just by buying Microsoft uh, Office 365. And then if you have any kind of uh, basic security system through an IT provider or through a VPN, then you'll be able to be well on the way to doing it. And now you just have to explain it in your in your, uh, <clears throat> your level one explanation so that when you eventually come to get audited by a CMC auditor, then you will be able to pass. Uh, every, every time, time I bring, bring up CMMC, as you see on the next uh, slide, I have that implementation flow. Uh, this, this is the entire program, and a lot, a lot of the stuff, stuff on the left is being done, done or has been done. What, what you're, you're going to have concerns about is in the bottom center, center of this slide, it says, says find a certifier. certifier. That means find an assessor who is being trained as we speak on how to assess and evaluate somebody's uh, cybersecurity plan that meets level one, which is, uh, just to explain, 17 items out of the list, at least for DOD. That's, That's what that NSA does. And then after you find a certifier, you go over there to the uh, uh, right hand side now there's, there's going to be a, a certification analysis that's going to be conducted the rfe that it involves whether you're a prime or a sub it's going to tell you what level everybody in that supply chain has to be which is going to be level one two or three or virtually all except some of the highest level uh, classified contract and as you can see, source selection is go or no go. You're either certified or you're not. If you are, then the primes will be looking at you for the other reasons associated with the team you're in. If you're not, you're done. Because this CMMC requirement flows down through the entire uh, supply chain. So, that's what we have to have is that certificate. So in, in 2020 here, which is, uh, is actually sort of the title of my, my other presentation, you want to focus on getting your system to meet at least those 17 requirements identified in the DOD annex so that you can be ready for your audit. So now we move on to the next slide, and this is a lot more significant, I think, than most people realize. This slide is a statute 1656, which applies only to DOD, and it covers defense, telecom equipment, and services. And if you have those services provided by Huawei or ZTE, for sure, or a Russian source, you have to disclose it. And if you disclose it and it's in your prime contract, it relates to covered missions, which is, uh, or which can be essentially interpreted as anything the DOD does because the coverage missions are defined as a nuclear deterrence mission and a homeland defense mission. And whatever the DOD does is a homeland defense mission. And those two part clauses down at the bottom are the prohibition and a representation. A representation which you can put in, in uh, SAM is uh, a once a year rep that says we, we don't, don't buy anything or buy anything, anything from Huawei or ZTE. And then, and then because of the, the Huawei affiliates and subsidiaries, uh, the Commerce Department, through the Export Administration Regulation Part 744, uh, Supplement Number 4, and I've got the date there for the last time that was amended, that will tell you how many Subsidiaries and affiliates, Huawei. 
And I tell you right now, they have, have affiliates in 44 countries. So it's, so it's not just something, something coming from, from the People's Republic of China. China. It's, it's something that could be coming from, 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 from Denmark, France, France, or the UK. So you have to be able to track under this statute. You have to be able to track your uh, supply chain. chain. All the way down to that. Now, now on the next, next slide, slide, I've got, got the statute that applies to all federal contracts. The first thing is what is basically A9, A1A, capital A, which prohibits right now, in effect, uh, right, right now, now or since, since August 2019. Uh, can't purchase anything from Huawei, ZTE, Hedera, Dua, or Hangzhou, or any affiliate, affiliate thereof, and sell it. The government cannot purchase that. And in their their dash 25 clause at the bottom, that's the prohibition. And in the dash 26 clause, which is, a, as you can see, is a recent clause, that's where you can represent that you are not supplying products or services from those uh, Chinese companies. These are basically the Chinese restrictions. And effective August 13 of this year, this is AA9A1B, the government, the entire U.S. government is prohibited from purchasing from a company that uses any covered telecom products or equipment or services or video surveillance equipment from those Chinese companies. So the first statute is China and Russia. The second statute is Thailand only. First statute is DOD only. Second statute is all federal contracts. That is a big leverage if you can prove to a prime that your supply chain management plan can make that representation. And the bigs will make sure through their own audit of your system uh, that they can meet that standard. And now we go to the, the last slide, or the second to last slide here, uh, and this is the COVID. And that, that covers, covers everything. Uh, there can be no one in the world now who is not seeing a COVID uh, cyber, cyber seminar just yet. yet. So we'll, we'll you know, have, have, to, have, have to wait and see, see but that, that I think is going to be a significant element of uh, the reforms that high level. level our higher, higher level, level team, team members are going to impose on all team members. So, so there, there are three statutes on the, on COVID, uh, on the pandemic right, right now. And those those things are going over. Oh, on, on, on the next slide, slide uh, if, if you, you have done, done a good, good job of handling yourself under this thing, and these are some, some of the items that I've listed here. here. Uh, and, and the most important, important one that, that relates to this one is going to be a cybersecure telework plan, plan which a cybersecure telework plan, plan is quite expensive. expensive. Uh, level, level three CMMC compliance is, is expensive. But then, then you can, can, if you can demonstrate that, that you manage, manage your supply chain with, with the Chinese, Chinese restrictions, for example. example and, and how, how you manage, manage your supply chain with respect to the requirements under uh, the pandemic guidance, you'll have, have another advantage over all of your uh, competitors for that particular uh, team uh, agreement. And one, one of the things at the very bottom I've got here, a rated order contract, contract. One, one of the things, things that's a big deal in this COVID uh, pandemic, pandemic operation is how did you handle is how, how are you going to handle your sense under the defense production act 
So if you performed a rated order, that would be something in your favor for purposes of establishing yourself as a, a particularly good uh, teammate uh, for purposes of getting on the team for the prime contract or lower tier sub, uh, subcontract and what you're trying to get off. Okay. That uh, is the end. It's the 25 minutes or so that Jennifer insists on. And I'm done. If you have any questions, you can see there on the slide that uh, you can send me an email and I'll respond to it or leave me a voice and I'll take it from there. Okay. Thank you very much. I appreciate you all uh, listening this afternoon. Thank you, David, for a great presentation and sharing your time with us. And thank you to everyone who joined us. The recording will be on our website and YouTube channel within the next 24 hours. Please join us this Friday as we cover each part of the FAR and join us next Wednesday for more hot topics in federal, federal contracting. Thank you.